Welcome to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Cindy and Craig Corey are the parents of Rachel Corey, a 23-year-old American peace activist who was crushed to death in Gaza by an Israeli bulldozer on March 16, 2003, about 12 years ago, almost to the day. Rachel was undertaking nonviolent direct action to protect the home of a Palestinian family from demolition. They're also the co-founders of the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Um, first of all, I know it's been 12 years, but uh, as, a, as a parent, the, the, the searing pain of a loss of a kid, 12 years probably doesn't mean very much. No, I think uh, you, don't, you don't get better, you get stronger. The, the pain doesn't go away, you just get capable of handling it. And uh, one of the great things for us, we've gone around the country, we meet, there's so many families have had losses like ours. But uh, it's good for us that Rachel was doing exactly what she wanted to do when she was killed. And she was telling us what we could do. You know, she said, come here, come here. And she wanted us to see Gaza. She wanted people to work out for the people of Gaza to try and make a, a better world there. So um, she really gave us, uh, we inherited from our daughter, a, a cause and some friends and uh, you know, something that we could do in human memory. I think uh, sometimes that Rachel's story, when they when they meet us for the first time, people people feel um, troubled and a lot of the pain uh, hits them. In a way, we're living with it all the time. Uh, it's you know, it's something. It was the worst day of our lives, March sixteenth, two thousand three, and we continue to live with that. And I, re I remember there was a time uh, when Craig and I were driving from Washington State where we were living to the Midwest to see our family. It's a drive that our families took many, many times. And I, there was a beautiful moon over the mountains as we were going across the Cascade Mountains. And I wondered if anything would look as beautiful to me again as it, as it had before Rachel was killed. And uh, then somehow, and I can't tell you exactly the point when it happened, all of the color came back into my life. And I think probably for any people that experience a loss, that, that there is, there are these periods that you have to go through. And, um, and I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that that color is back, that I enjoy life. And I, am, uh, I wish that some of the things that we're working on, that the problems would go away so we could work on something else. Um, but we're so supported and invigorated by the people who come and uh, are joining in, in this work. And, and the work we're talking about is you've been pursuing a legal case, um, suing the Israeli government, the Israeli army. Uh, just quickly for people don't, that don't know the basic story, just tell us what yeah, happened. Yeah, that's part of our work. But, um, and Rachel was killed on March 16, 2003. She went to the Gaza Strip with a group called the International Solidarity Movement. They're a group of people that were formed because uh, the Palestinians had wanted and the UN had called for some human rights observers to be in that area. The US uh, vetoed that. And so some people thought, well, they don't have to be with the UN. It could be anybody. And so people from around the world were, were going there. And Rachel wasn't in the first wave, kind of the second or third, but uh, she went then in, uh, in January of 2003. And she headed down to Rafa, I think partly because Gaza is one of the most forsaken places in the world, and Rafa in Gaza was one of the most forsaken. And she lived with those families. You know, she was uh, often on, uh, slept uh, in their houses, uh, in the house in, which, in front of which she was killed. She was standing in front of a wall as a bulldozer came at it. And, uh, but she, is, she knew those the families. She worked with the older boy on his English and he tried to help her with her Arabic and stuff. So they were friends. But uh, the Israelis were clearing a swath of land between the Gaza Strip and Egypt. Not Israel, but Egypt. And, the, and when I say clearing, they're pushing down people's homes. And these homes have several extended, you know, one extended family, so they might have 30 people in one of these buildings. But in the particular home that uh, Rachel was standing in front of that day, there were two, two brothers and their uh, five children, and the wives, five children. 
And uh, these bulldozers would come up that day to the activist's feet, pushing them. These are huge bulldozers, uh, D9, D10 bulldozers, D9 in her case, armored, 65-ton bulldozers. They come up right to the activist's feet, pushing their dirt, and then they would stop. But at 5 o'clock, uh, a bulldozer came up towards Rachel, and right behind her was the Nasrallah house, and it didn't stop. It went over, her, and her friends say, without picking up his blade, backed up. She somehow survived for moments after that. She was between the tracks of the bulldozer, it's clear from pictures we've seen. And so she said to her friend Alice, uh, I think my back is broken. But that was her last words. The, uh, what the Israelis were doing, some people have described as collective punishment. And it's important to say hundreds of Palestinians were killed in the same area, and, and many of them were children. The uh, Human Rights Watch report, Raising Rafa, reported that from 2000 to 2004, a tenth of the population of Rafa in southern Gaza lost their homes. There were over 1,600 homes demolished. And uh, this was more than collective punishment. It was a, um, certainly many, many, many people suffered. Uh, but it was a very deliberate policy to take control of more of that area. As Craig said, it was along the Egyptian border with Gaza, not the Israeli border. The Philadelphia Corridor is a very nor narrow route that by treaty the Israeli military had um, had access to. And it, it, But it was very narrow, this Philadelphia Corridor, but plenty uh, large for their equipment to move through it. But what they kept doing was to take row after row of houses. This was not uh, directed at families that had uh, particularly uh, had any violence towards the military at all, although you'll read that sometimes. Well, that's, certainly that's what the Israelis have said, that there were snipers and there were various other people shooting at Israeli soldiers. Yeah. And they were, this is why they're knocking down houses. This was during, you know, during the um, height of the Second Intifada. And certainly there was resistance there and there was violence there. But it gets, I think it gets very distorted in the uh, reports, actually, because um, there were actually more Israeli soldiers, for example, killed in the West Bank during that period than there were in Gaza. Uh, the, the clearing that was happening, you have to remember that there were 8,000 settlers in Gaza at the time. And I forget the number, but t between 20 and 22 settlements, I think around 22 settlements. A lot of them were in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. One of the things that made Rachel really sad was that children that she lived with who were living under the most uh, terrible conditions. Many of them hadn't seen the ocean. Craig and I have been there. Mediterranean Sea is very nearby. It's beautiful. And, and when I went there, uh, when emotionally it was just really, really hard, when I would finally get up north and be able to see the Mediterranean, it was like a breath of fresh air. And Rachel felt sad because the children she was living with hadn't seen it. They, be five, six, seven years old, but because the settlements had access to the ocean, uh, not, the, not the families, not the Palestinian families, there was this limitation. Um, so Israeli policy at the time was to take more and more of this area. There's a famous quote from a, a, a colonel, I believe, Yom uh, Tav Samia on Israeli army radio that said, uh, no matter what happens, each time there's any resistance, we need to take another row of houses. So there was definitely an expansionist plan uh, with that whole area at the time. I just think it's important for people to know uh, that it wasn't like they targeted one house there and took, took down that house for punitive reasons. It, they were uh, taking all the houses in the area. In our, in our court case in Israel, our attorney asked the deputy battalion commander, how far did the Philadelphia corridor go? And he said, up to the next row of houses, I think was his response. It means it keeps getting it bigger keeps as getting we knock bigger. down houses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things, as you say, they would like you to think they're terrorists in those, those homes, that the home that Rachel stood in front of, the one she was killed in, that family later came to the United States, or the younger brother, his wife, and a baby that was born after Rachel was killed. Well, to get here, they had to go to Tel Aviv to, to get a visa. And so after, sometime later, 
after Rachel was killed. The house has been knocked down, but even after that, the Israeli military give a pass to this family that was in the house to go walk freely in Tel Aviv for a day, go to the U.S. Embassy, and of course the U.S. Embassy does not give a pass to a Palestinian male, 34 years old, easily to come to the United States. But they got that, they traveled in the United States. And it, so Israel and United States had nothing against the family that Rachel stood in front of their house, but, uh, but Rachel was killed. When Rachel left to join the, it's under the auspices of the International Solidarity Movement, right? Yeah. Um, what motivates her to go? I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, in the, on the left and generally, uh, you know, who, who see what's wrong with what's going on, not just with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but many such things, they don't get up and go. And they, they don't get up and put their body on the line. Rachel, I think from a very early age, was somebody I thought was really remarkable as I look back on it, is she refused to look away from marginalized people. So uh, she wrote as a 12-year-old about the homeless in Olympia, our, our hometown, and how we would give them a dollar so we didn't really have to look at them, how uh, we would... Um, would support them from afar, but didn't want to be close enough to smell their breath. You know, she worked with uh, mentally ill people when she was in high school and, and through college. And so I think that it makes, in a very broad sense, some sense for her then to choose to, to go uh, because there really is nobody more marginalized than somebody in Rafa. Specifically, I think the attacks on uh, September 11th she uh, realized that, um, that there was some, you know, there's something going on. She's aware of the world, like most of us. And she didn't buy uh, George W. Bush's uh, excuse that they hate us for our freedom. So she, what she literally said is, I would like to go somewhere and see what it's like to be on the other side of uh, my tax dollars in uh, U.S. foreign policy. So, um, so she found out about the uh, international solidarity movement. She, some of her professors had been to Israel. One was Israeli, had been in the Israeli military, and also then was one of the founders of Women in Black, who in Israel stand uh, silently in black trying to uh, bring attention to the occupation. So she had some knowledgeable people. She, she learned Arabic. She took that in school before she went. Uh, so she knew people that were knowledgeable uh, in that area and, and young people that had been before, but eventually she, she went. Mm. Did you have a sense of how dangerous it might be? Um, you know, Craig and I were living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time because of a job change for Craig. And uh, I remember when Rachel first told me that this is what she was thinking about doing, I went to the internet and started to look for some other options. Uh, we have family connections in India. I knew uh, that she had a really strong need um, to do meaningful things in her life. And she had an international focus, of international bent. When she, she was very privileged. I mean, she felt like a, a very privileged person growing up in Olympia, Washington, and uh, in a middle-class family where she had lots of opportunity. She was able to travel to Russia as a high school student. She was there for six weeks. We had uh, exchange students in our home, and uh, we had after the Soviet Union broke up. We had uh, a, an exchange, or a student from Russia that came with her teacher and several other students. And then Rachel was one of several high school students that went back and spent six weeks in Yuzno Sokolinsk in, in Eastern Russia. And so she had that experience and that really changed her outlook because here, you know, there was all this negative um, uh, in our media and so forth and coming from our government about the Soviet Union and about Russia. And, and then Rachel met the people and fell in love with the people there. And after that, she, she spent some time in Belize. She had a, a high school trip to Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, so uh, her, her perspective at a very young age had become pretty global. Mm. And she just had a strong need to be out there in the world. That said, uh, 
she didn't, and she didn't want to frighten us. She did educate us. Uh, I think, you know, Rachel really brought us to the issue. I think we were like a lot of uh, American families who had always heard about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It was always in the news, particularly the Jewish-Israeli perspective. And that's the one that we um, identified with. That's, that, I read stories to the kids about um, uh, young people during the Holocaust who were hidden away and survived and about the ones who didn't. So that's where we were coming from and the Palestinians were really removed from our experience. So uh, she was educating me even across the country uh, before, she, before she traveled. She was sending me links to websites and that kind of thing. But, and she, I remember her writing at one point, if you look at this, you know, you might become a little fearful. She, and I know she didn't want us to be afraid. Um, but she said nobody in the international solidarity movement had been killed. There had been an injury or so, but nobody had died in that. And so, you know, she was, she was trying to help us along. And uh, I remember her first phone call to us in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I think it, that was a point when Craig and I really couldn't even talk about it with each other after that call because I could hear the trembling in her voice when she was in Rafa, and she said, can you hear that? Can you hear that? And it was tanks that were going up and, up and down this Philadelphia corridor. And she was in, in, actually in the house that she stood in front of when she was killed, making that phone call, and it was nighttime. And the, um, I remember feeling uh, worried then. Uh, but also, as, as she was there longer, what we saw happening through her writing and through her communications is she was okay. And people were, she was telling wonderful stories about the people that she was staying with. And we saw her confidence grow in her ability to be there and to do the work that needed to be done. And she was working with the Children's Parliament. Um, she went uh, connected with women's organizations, uh, was living with these families and working with other internationals who had come for the same reasons that she had come. Um, I remember when we finally made it to Gaza in September of 2003 and we went to the uh, General Union of Palestinian Wom Women and Fatima, the woman who was there, so proudly pulled out for me a note that Rachel had left on International Women's Day. Uh, we went and visited families. And uh, we have uh, actually in a book of Rachel's writing, Nyla's letter, a young uh, Palestinian woman that Rachel had written a letter into the, her, her um, journal. And it was all about how the world should be ashamed of this and how Nyla should hold on to her dreams. And of uh, now she had all this ability to be, you know, any of these things that she wanted to be. And, uh, and how much Rachel was learning from Nyla and people like her about the human spirit and about um, dignity, just how much Rachel had learned there. So, so I think in terms of our anxiety about it all, of course we were concerned. I was particularly concerned when the war with Iraq was starting and there was a lot of uncertainty about what that would bring. But uh, we saw how meaningful this was and we were learning from her. Uh, I told you that we had, you know, we had heard about this issue forever, but all of a sudden, here's our daughter. We know what a careful observer she is. We know how careful she is about her words, and this is what she's sharing. This is the picture that she's sharing with Craig and me, but, and also with our extended family and her friends that just completely uh, changed our view of the whole situation. Okay, we're going to continue talking. Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Craig and Cindy Corey on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.